Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice today on the show. Yes, iconic guitarist Michael Schenker, uh, who's got a new album out, Immortal, which is going to be released January 29, 2021 on Nuclear Blast. Michael, how you doing? Considering the circumstances, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a lot. This last year has been very difficult for all of us. Yeah. All right. Well, the exciting news is you have this new album with a whole bunch of new guests. You have Ronnie Romero, you have Michael Voss, of course he's been with you for a while, Ralph Sheepers, Jolyn Turner, and uh, the list goes on and on. Why did you decide to change artists from before to now? Like you have a whole new set of people. Well, you know, like everything in my life <clears throat> happens um, by circumstances. And uh, so... I, I live in the moment, and, uh, you know, my original idea was to have guest musicians, uh, friends and fans, um, to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And uh, that would have been in 2020 to be released. But uh, somehow... Uh, my original idea was, you know, to have actually what I ended up with. Mm -hmm. But in between, there was a, you know, that getting musicians lined up and together, it, it is very, very complicated if you plan it. And, and I planned it and it was dragging on and it came to the point when I realized, wait a minute, you know, the first note I put on some Crow Scorpions was when I was 15 and in 1970. And so this album cannot be released until 21. My agent told me, but your album, the uh, Scorpions Lonesome Crow was actually uh, released in 72. And so I said, ah, that gives me two years. <laughs> To, to 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 celebrate, get it all together, and and the timing is going to be fine. And so, but the experience of getting all you know by dragging and dragging and getting guest musicians, etc. I, I decided to 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 have a compact um, band, um, you know, and and I decided for Ronnie James. I mean, not Ronnie James Dio, but... Ronnie Romero. You know, yeah, Ronnie Romero. And uh, who, you know, I discovered uh, when he was singing on a Michael Schenker Test album, and uh, he, he, he has uh, the ability to sing like anybody. Um, it, it, it's amazing. I mean... I was wondering why Richie Blackmore was choosing him. You know, and I understand today why. You know, because uh, Richie and I, we have lots of parallels. I mean, anybody who leaves um, Rainbow or, you know, even with Deep Purple, they asked me in, in 93 to join them. So my first producer was Roger Glover from Deep Purple. And it's it just... It's just like, and then he, and then uh, Richie did acoustics. Uh, you know, I did acoustic stuff, and he did, and uh, you know, so so, and then and then you have all got uh, Vinnie Moore from the same agent, uh, from that, from the same management as uh, um, Deep Purple got um, to replace Richie Blackmore. So so there is an endless endless amount of similarities between Richie and myself. So, you know, I, I, I was wondering why he picked Ronnie Romero, because I don't listen to music, and I don't know what's out there um, for the last 50 years, and, and, uh, but I, I understand what he was up to, and, <laughs> and because he's in such a similar situation as, you know, I am in such a similar situation as he is, 
um, he needed to find a singer who can sing all the hits, you know, written by a, a Ross Ballard and, uh, you know, and, 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 and be able to sing like Jolene Turner and, and Ronnie, James Beal and, uh, you know, all the uh, Graham Bonnet and all the great singers that he had um, for a show that he prepared, uh, you know, in London. And uh, so I, I, I kind of thought, you know, that because I'm in such a similar situation with so many different singers and uh, it, 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 it would be great to have Ronnie as the main singers singer and and to continue life and uh, be, have a compact band the Barry Sparks you know he kept emailing me I want to be your bass player <laughs> and I said you got it and you know and so it um, I kept Steve Mann Bodo Shop uh, you know and uh, so we we the idea was to to just uh, make it easier and uh, do a 50th anniversary. But the virus showed up. Yeah. And, you know, I call the virus a bittersweet experience. Nothing sweet about it, to be honest. But it, it kind of directed me back to my original idea, but without me planning it, but just by circumstances. I got all of these incredible musicians on this album. I, 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 I honestly, I tell you, step by step, how it all happened is it's just a miracle. It's unbelievable. Yeah. L let me ask you this. Are you planning on taking who, from these new musicians on your album? Not new musicians, but we'll say <clears throat> to uh, this project, who are you planning to bring live? <clears throat> Okay, Ronnie Romero, you, you mentioned. Is there anyone else you want to bring live with you? Now, you know, it, it's like, you know, the thing is, I, I live in the now. You know, the virus, you know, uh, we don't know what's going to happen and what will, you know, happen around the corner in life. And so, um, yes, I, I, I made up a, a um, you know, a... a, a a, a more, you know, because of the Michael Schenker Fest coming from Bangkok and from all over the world, um, it's, it's still there, actually. It, 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 it will still perform uh, if people can afford it. It's such an expensive undertaking. But, uh, yeah, uh, eventually, you know, throughout the whole uh, period of the virus developing and so on, and with the borders being locked and, and people not being able to, you know, it, 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 it just became all so complicated. And, uh, but in the end, I ended up with what I originally planned, but much better than I could have ever done it, um, you know, contemplating it. But uh, uh, universally speaking, it, it, it was all brought to me. And, and that is the beautiful thing. All right. Uh, so this album, I've heard it, and I'm and congratulations. It sounds great. A lot of variety. Thank you. And, and what I love the most about it, being a big Scorpions fan, is In Search of Peace of Mind. You know, Lonesome Crow, the first album. Can you tell me about the feeling of redoing that song? You know, it's, it's probably one of the best songs on Lonesome Crow. Just what was the feeling like revisiting that song for, you know, 50 years, right? Yeah, yeah, it it is the best song, and it was and the, the fantastic thing is it was the very first ever piece of music I wrote, and uh, I was 15 years old. I did it in my mother's kitchen. There was nobody there. And Michael Foss, co-producer, actually sent me the original credits of Lonesome Crow, and it says uh, Michael Schenker lyrics and Rudolf Schenker lyrics. We had zero knowledge of English. How could we have been <laughs> the people <laughs> doing the lyrics? <laughs> Misinformation completely, you know. But I was 15, they were 21. And, uh, you know, that composition um, in search of the peace of mind, I mean, Rudolf can't even play that. It's actually pretty complex if you get into the details of the original version. But it was such an incredible start for myself, you know, to put the first note 
on a record with a song like this. And, uh, you know, it's, it's titled In Search of the Peace of Mind, you know, Looking for Contentment. That's the theme of my life. And, and, and it's so ironic. It all fits so well together. And then it ends up in the end on the album as an epic adding yes. to the end. Yeah. Sounds like when I listen to it, it sounds like an inner conversation of making choices. You know, like we all have inner conversations between, you know, <laughs> between shall I do it? Shall I not? Um, um, you know, um, all the temptations that we have within ourselves and the conversations about it um, to make a decision, you know, everything is a choice. And uh, so the uh, so the, the, the end solo ended up like a conversation actually describing my, my whole 50 years. And, and, and basically, there's so many different elements on that outro solo with the wawa and with a, a howler and and all this different i don't know approach and, and all the different it sounds like question and answer you know uh, within yourself and and i i couldn't have wished for a better result yeah, than that i agree with you i'm a huge fan of lonesome crow do you ever read think of redoing maybe the song Lonesome Crow or something else off that album. It's a great album. Your playing is, that's one of your, I don't know, I, I just find your playing is excellent on that album for such a young age. What, what do you remember from that well, time? Well, the thing, the thing is that uh, for some reason, for some very strange reason, the, the, the solo, the middle solo of the original version was so perfect, I would never, ever change a note. Like Leslie West uh, Mountain uh, theme of the imaginary Western or Stairway to Heaven or whatever. Sometimes something like that happens. It's so magical, but I did not understand where it was coming from because I was developing as a guitarist. I was only 50 years old, you know, and you can hear the progress of myself, like going from phenomenon to force it and so on. And, uh, and, and it, it, the funny thing also is that uh, Kurt Hammett, he, he is a Michael Schenker fan, and when I hear his vibrato, <laughs> he sounds like, like, like Lonesome Crow. And but you know, I must say that the rest of Lonesome Crow of my lead guitar playing was, um, you can hear that is a nervous vibrato. I'm developing. I'm you know getting better over the years, but. Uh, Lonesome Crow itself, the middle solo, was so perfect, I have no clue where it came from. <laughs> what, what, and I'll ask you my last question on Lonesome Crow. What was the environment, like, when the album was finished, what was your reaction? What was your feeling about this album? Oh, I'm absolutely excited, you know. I was listening to Led Zeppelin, um, just a year before, you know, in my bedroom, um, when I was a 14 or so, and uh, it was the uh, it was one song, one of my favorite songs of all time, uh, the immigrant song, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that lonesome crow. One year later, was coming through the same radio. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> I was, uh, it, it, it was a great feeling. And your brother, like, I mean, did he contribute? I mean, that's some pretty complex playing on Lonesome Crow. Did your brother contribute much musically to that album, or is it more you? Nothing at all. Nothing. He can't even play it. The thing is that I wrote most of Lonesome Crow, but because I was 15, they were 21. They took advantage of me, and they wanted a piece of the pie, and they wanted to be involved in, in, in their first experience of of an um, album that was recorded for the first time for everybody. And, uh, but I think there was also a, a, a kind of, uh, you know, being inexperienced, making the first record that they didn't quite understand, or maybe they did, I, I, I have no clue, but, you know, Rudolf always puts um, music written by Rudolf Schenker 
and the lyrics written by so and so. They should have done that on that on Lonesome Crow. Yes, they should have said Michael Schenker, you know, uh, the, the music written by Michael Schenker, the, the the lyrics written by whoever. And uh, I, I guess there was a couple of of moments where um, maybe um, I, I don't remember, but where maybe Rudolph or somebody had. Uh, uh, an, an, an influence in writing, but I was the musician, I was the artist. I, I, I was always focusing on music. Okay. All right. All right, let's get back to your new album. Um, what was it life like working with Ralph Sheepers? I mean, an incredible vocalist, right? My first time you're recording with him, what was it like? You did two songs, Devil's Daughter and Drill to Kill, I believe, right? Yeah, I just you know it, it 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 just came out of nowhere because I had to I had to um, you know my original idea of making a 50th anniversary with guest musicians, fans, and friends um, dragged on, and I you know missed the timing. Of, of a release of 2020 then my agent told me but the album was released in 72 and I said ah oh, I have two hours I mean two years to actually <laughs> I can actually go back to to um, um, carry because I actually gave up on making this album because I, I, I thought I missed the timing and so now I had two years and uh, I then that's when I decided to have a compact band uh, because it was so complicated with guest musicians, and uh, and then and then it ended up the way I originally wanted it, but yeah. <laughs> without without my input, it, it just came out of nowhere, and so everybody came out of nowhere. Rob Shepard, I mean, Joel Turner. Everybody, Brian Tichy, I mean, Derek Serenian, I mean, all these incredible players, they showed up bit by bit, uh, finding out that I was doing the 50th anniversary, calling up Michael Foss and saying, hey, I, I, I'm a Michael Schenker fan, I want to make a, 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 a contribution, you know. And it, it was amazing. After the rain, Michael Voss sings on it, I believe. An incredible, probably one of the best tracks on the album. I mean, you're handing over the vocals to Mike, and I believe he sings on the Queen of Thorns, Thorn and Thorns and Roses too. Correct? Yeah, and and and, and you know, it it it. I never planned for that, but you know, um, Michael Foss always writes a B plan for for vocals uh, while I'm putting down my my backing tracks, and uh, and he comes up. You know, with you know, like for instance, Warrior of Resurrection. Um, I came back from the hotel. He said, "Like Michael, this is what I did to your to the music he put down last night." And it was Warrior. I said, "Michael, that is unbelievable." Be actually, became one of the best songs ever. You know, and so um, the same with uh, um, After the Rain. I, I I came back from the hotel, and and he <laughs> exactly did the same thing. I listen michael i i i wrote this as a b plan and uh, i said michael this is so beautiful only you can sing this this is coming from your heart this is incredible and everything i mean the melody and and, and i never and it was a power ballad i never have done a power ballad as far as i remember in my whole life and so that was shocking in a way because I never expected anything like that, you know, showing up on the album. And so, you know, Michael Foss became the singer for that song because I couldn't imagine anybody else singing it better than him. And uh, and then there was this other unusual song, which I must say unusual because, you know, it's it, it's it's kind of different. But what he did to it was so amazing and so personal from the lyrics point of view as well that uh, I could not imagine anybody else singing it. And, you know, so I said, Michael, you know, you got those two songs. Yeah, 
you know, it's a very well-rounded album with a lot of different... I, I really enjoyed it. You know, I think it's a nice shift from what you're doing. So now you have MSG, which originally, of course, what you started with, but you've moved away from the Michael Schenker Fest name. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, Michael Schenker Fest is still available. Everything is still available. Even Michael Schenker Temple of Rock, anything is still available. People want it and can afford it, especially the Michael Schenker Fest. Very expensive people coming from all over the world, uh, top singers, and uh, it, it, it is um, there when people can afford it. But the Michael Schenker Group, in fact, from the 80s onwards, everything is Michael Schenker Group with subtitles like Michael Schenker's Temple of Rock, Michael Schenker Affairs, and which is a good thing because it helps everybody to kind of relate to what Michael Schenker Group are we talking about? You know, the first one was Michael Schenker Group, then the second one was MSG, and then you know that the first one was with Simon Phillips, the more foster from Jeff Beck. And uh, the second one was with Colsey Powell and, you, and Paul Raymond UFO and, 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 and Chris Glenn and so on. And then we even had an MSG with uh, Robin McCauley. Uh, I gave him the M. I didn't care about if I had the first M or not, mm. but I wanted to keep the MSG. And so you have, uh, a, a, but it's still a Michael Schenker group. It's, 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 it's not at all uh, uh, McCauley Schenker, even though it's very different, and I let other people, you know, write. But it all, everything always starts with Michael Schenker Group, and 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 uh, you know because I, it, it just in the end of the day, there's so many different lineups that people start getting confused, and and uh, I recognize that in, in in interviews, and that's why I make it clear, you know that to categorize uh, and giving Michael Schenker Group with so many different lineups, um, subtitles like Michael Schenker's Temple of Rock, Michael Schenker Fest, it helps everybody to know when it happened, who was in it, why did it happen, and so on. You know, I mean, Michael Schenker Fest was all original singers um, for the comp from the 80s uh, with, the, with, the, with the songs I wrote. And... Uh, the, the, the Michael Schenker's Temple of Rock is the one um, with uh, Herman Rabel and Francis Buchholz from the Scorpions. And so people always can refer, you know, to the time when it was done and which Michael Schenker group it is. All right. Um, and just some offbeat questions. You talked about Deep Purple when uh, Richie Blackmore left. You were invited, right, to join Deep Purple or audition? Was that... Was yeah, that... in ninety no, in ninety three, I got a phone call. I was the first person to be chosen. You know, you have you have to remember, Richie Blackmore and I have so much parallel. Everything that comes, everything that re leaves Richie Blackmore joins a Michael Schenker crew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the funniest thing. And so, you know, Rochak Lover was uh, producing the first Michael Schenker Club album, Deep Purple. You know, and so. There was always a conversation within Deep Purple, also in Black Sabbath, you know, because Wendy Rhodes was a Michael Schenker fest, and you know, it, 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 that's why Ozzy called me up and, and asked me to join. I, I was always the first, you know, choice, but I declined. And 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 I must say, you know, the funny thing is because I'm the kid in the sandbox, you know, just enjoying playing. I never look for competition or fame or anything. I just like to put three notes together to create goose pimples and, and pure self-expression is, is what I love. And so, you know, when 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 I get these offers from, from, from Thin Lizzy and, uh, uh, you know, Motorhead and uh, Ian Hunter, I mean, the, the list is countless. I always decline because... I don't copy. I don't want to copy. I want to do pure self-expression. But the funny thing is that I love Ozzy Osbourne. And I love, you know, the, I mean, Led Zeppelin, Be Purple, and, and, and Black Sabbath. It, it, that's it, you know, for me when I was 14, 15 years old. And, and uh, you know, that, that is the incredible thing. 
even though I'm the biggest fan of those three bands and some others, um, that I declined uh, because I had the vision of, you know, focusing on pure self-expression. That's why I left, you know, mainly the the um, UFO, which would have become one of the biggest bands in the world. They were peaking, uh, starting to peak. Uh, Scorpions, Love Drive, uh, you know, they asked me to help them out. And because Matthias wasn't able, he opened the doors for America for them. Um, I wrote the first hit for UFO, Lights Out, uh, in 21 uh, uh, in 76 and 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 you know it it was the ticket for Rudolf and Klaus you know to 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 make it into the states and uh, but uh, unfortunately I had a different vision I cannot follow a bunch of people looking for something that I have already finished with and don't actually I'm not even interested in and uh, but my own vision is more important than you know following a bunch of people that have something completely different in mind, and that's why um, my middle years became very experimental, and I'm very happy I did it because it really fulfilled me. Yeah, and the last question would be an Eddie Van Halen question. You know, you being an iconic guitarist, Eddie Van Halen becoming an was an iconic guitarist. You know, just any comments about Eddie Van Halen and his guitar playing or his influence on you or maybe others? You know, uh, any comments on Eddie Van Halen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the weirdest thing is that actually Van Halen was supporting UFO at the Starwood. I was 19 years old, I guess. And uh, I didn't, nobody knew, well, it was what, what year would that that would have been uh, 74, 75, you know, and, and um, I, it, it, I never paid, I heard that some people were saying there's a phenomenal guitarist there, but uh, it was five years before they brought out the Van Halen one, um, which, you know, even though I'm not listening to any music for the last 50 years, sometimes you cannot overhear things coming out of speakers everywhere, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. And when I, when I heard Eddie, I went like, wow, this is amazing. But I didn't know that he actually was doing the tapping technique because I was always wondering how, how on earth does he get such a smooth guitar sound, you know? And then even without the tapping, everybody was doing tapping later and trashed Eddie, you know, just just like they did with me, they copied my style. In the, people copied my style. Eighty uh, percent of all guitarists in the eighties, and and trust my style too. But I go to the inner infinite spring and always come up with something fresh. So I'm always a step ahead anyway. But uh, with with a, with a tapping that was so extreme, and everybody, and it was actually in the end, it, it appeared to be easy to do for overnight success. So there was like thousands of guitarists yeah. going to guitar school, learning tapping <laughs> to be <laughs> to be a star in, in one or two years. And uh, well, that that shows that tapping is not all and, and, and not really um, actually doesn't create much emotion. But the thing with Eddie Van Halen, he had rhythm, style, and uh, oh, by the way, Rudolf told me that, that he actually heard something Eddie did, you know, earlier. That uh, because it looks like Eddie was actually a bit influenced by me, and uh, there was a melody line or, or some several things that he did that sounded like me, and people were actually saying, um, "Wow, you know, it, it sounds like Michael Schenker." But the thing is, he took it uh, in the next five years, he took it so far um, forward that I was blown away by how he, what he did, you know. And his drummer, his uh, brother being a drummer, so it's in a family gene, that his sense of rhythm, his sense of melody, his sense of sound, uh, tone, quality, the way he actually entertained was so complete. He's the best. Yeah. And on that note, uh, the new album, Immortal, 
were going to be released on January 23rd, uh, 29, 2021 via Nuclear Blast. I've heard it. Sounds amazing. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today, Michael. Always a pleasure. And I wish you all the best and all the success. And hopefully this COVID thing will be over soon and you could go on tour. Thank you so much. Thanks for the interview. And see you soon. Keep on rocking. <laughs> all right, bye. Say farewell to the future. Get